Sure. Well, Jason, you and I've never met and you just said you've, this is your first time on zoom. So you, uh, <laughs> you are blessed uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I, I've never been on zoom, but I have used Google meet meet before it used to be hangouts or whatever. So I yeah. have used video teleconferencing, but just, just not zoom itself. So, but I'm uh, originally from Pittsburgh. Um, both my families, my mother's family, my father's family were um, Catholic. Um, I, uh, but when they were like late teenagers, early twenties, they were, they were part of the, uh, Jesus movement, <laughs> uh, the late, late hippie Christian, um, you know, kind of, kind of situation. They had, they had really cool you know, home meetings and they would meet in the park and they'd have worship services and Bible studies and all that kind of stuff, real informal, um, non-institutional type situation there for a while. And then, uh, some folks said, um, you guys should really get into a church. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, they, um, they started, uh, um, at the AG, uh, Assemblies of God church, um, when I was a kid. Um, and then, uh, for, that was in Pittsburgh for a while there. And then, um, we, uh, we moved to the DC area when I was, um, uh, at finishing high school. Um, and so we were at a non-denominational church there, which was very similar, very similar to the type of AG that we were at before. Um, and we had um, a really good uh, youth pastor there at church. Um, and so at that high school is where I met my wife. Um, we got married uh, after, shortly after college. And um, we moved out further out of the DC area. I mean, we were still in the DC orbit, but we were further out in the interlands. <laughs> and um, we were helping out a, um, a friend of ours. It, actually, that youth that youth pastor went back to school, and um, he became a, a Foursquare minister, hmm. which is also similar to AG. Yep. Um, and Foursquare, um, he got uh, based at a church in just over the border in West Virginia, there, uh, not too far from where we're at, and we went out there to help him out. And, uh, my wife was, um, she did the music you know, in worship and I was on the council for a while and then eventually the treasurer. And so we had, we had a, um, a, a really good situation there, uh, a really good learning experience because we were with good people that we knew and, and were, were happy to be with and happy to be helping out in various ways in the church. And, um, and, we got to see a little bit behind the curtain <laughs> how, how things work in, in that world, you know, in the, in the church, um, in the, in the church itself, the denomination in the, you know, the, the, how things operated, um, institutionally. So, um, and then I started reading. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't, I hadn't really been a reader. I was math science and, and, uh, I'm a software engineer by trade. And, um, you know, sports and, and, uh, math and science were my thing. I really wasn't into reading or, you know, that, that, that side of the brain that what really wasn't for me. <laughs> I, I, so I thought, so I, I really started having a pretty good time reading. Um, I mean, it took me a while to get into it, uh, cause you know, all through school, it's mostly they, it's mostly, um, fiction, you know, uh, yep. when you're, when you're a young child, it's obviously fiction. And then as you, even if you get a little bit older, even through high school, it's mostly fiction. I mean, you're reading some nonfiction, but, um, I just, I just had, hadn't had the experience of getting into the types of material that I would have been interested in. And so I, st so I started with, um, the math, the, not math, uh, scientific, um, the Bible and science and all that, that whole, uh, debate on various topics within that, um, you know, realm. And, um, I had always, I had always wondered why there was such a problem for a lot of people, why, why there was so many, you know, um, people debating, you know, there's certain strains of Christians were debating, you know, people on these topics about, um, the age of the earth or evolution or, you know, there's lots of other types of topics that hit that, um, range. So, um, and because it's related to science and something that I am interested in generally, you know, or at least have a mind for somewhat, 
I figured, well, let me let me look at this as a, as a way into reading, as a way into learning how to read and becoming disciplined enough to actually understand what I'm reading. <laughs> get into a chapter and finish it and, fit and remember what I started reading about. And uh, so um, so that was fascinating. I was eye-opening. I eventually became more fluid at reading and, and uh, got to the point where I could actually make it through a whole book. And um, man, I, I caught fire. I read a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I, re I read, um, you know, uh, different people's reconciliation of their faith with, with, the, with, the, with you know, their profession in a lot of cases. So there was, I read about young earth creationists, old earth creationists, theistic evolution, or, or it, you know, um, all those different types of perspectives. Um, Hugh Ross uh, was one of the big ones, and um, Francis Collins, the head of NIH, he worked on the Human Genome Project, and he had a, he had a really cool book that he came out with, um, and, you know, talking about his perspective, and so that, that got me into, um, reading generally. And then I started getting into, I saw a video of someone had come by the church and had this video um, and thought I might be interested. I looked at it. It was Michael Frost. He was talking to a group in, um, I think, Minnesota or so somewhere in the U.S. He's Australian. Um, and he was talking about mission and um, a lot more than just about that, but that was kind of like the introduction to that. So I started reading a lot on Michael Frost and Alan Hirsch, and uh, talking about um, missional perspectives in, in the faith and, and um, you know, living in a post-Christian, um, you know, context, whether it's Europe or in their case, Australia, um, and, you know, being able to reach out to people and, and you know, in that, in that context and be able to um, you know, what, what do we do? What do we do as people of faith, of, as Christians, as, um, you know, people want to share our faith and, and in, a, in a place where it's no longer, you know, <laughs> it's, people no longer come to us, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and um, it was it was funny. You just had a discussion um, with David from Germany. <laughs> about yeah, a lot of this stuff, yeah. A lot of this type, type of thing. And, and it was funny because I had signed up before that before you had released that. So I didn't know you were going to talk with him about that. And I was like, oh, this is like all the stuff I wanted to talk about. <laughs> well, I just I just finished a very interesting conversation about creation science stuff. So that'll be coming oh, on the channel too. So keep going, keep going. You're doing great. Yeah. So um so the um missional um stuff and then how we do church, you know, which follows on from that, um the ecclesiology. And I really um I really had a very good experience as a young child um, with my folks having a, a very non-institutional, informal um, situation, you know, uh, with their with their ecclesiology, <laughs> and um, and I also was a part of an institutional form um, and understood how that worked a little bit and kind of kind of was. I've kind of been in the in the mode of um, going the non institutional route, <laughs> yep. and and uh, so we we moved back from West Virginia to Maryland, um, and uh, my wife and I have been involved in various projects um, in the past twelve years or so, um, and you know really have you know I've I've kind of um, had a, you know kind kind of a I've been wanting to talk things out with someone like yourself who has, who has the institutional perspective and, you know, can, can, and is also open, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, under, under is you know, willing to talk with someone who, who may, may be coming from a different perspective than they, they are coming from. So, and, um, it's hard to talk to, to people in churches like that, uh, especially clergy because the, because they quite often will quite, quite often will, will be, you know, uh, defensive or, 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 you know, uh, whatever, just, you know, it's, it's, it, it can be, it can be a threatening topic for yeah. someone who, oh, derives absolutely. Their, who derives their living from, from that's right. You're threatening their livelihood. <laughs> ah, right, you know, all right. those software engineers, they're destroying <laughs> the world. Why don't we ban them? <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. And I, and I get that. <laughs> I get that. And, um, and I, I'm, I really was coming from a place where, 
I had a fantastic, um, a fantastic example of a pastor and some and good people yep. within the institution. And so yep. I, and so there's very good people within all the different flavors of, of Christianity. Yeah. And, and, uh, but I, but I do, I still do hold, hold that the institution itself, I think is, can be a, can be a hindrance to the faith rather than a help. And, and I, I know your perspective is that, um, you know, you need that long-term, uh, that long-term vehicle, so to speak, to be able to keep the, keep the thing going or, or keep the, you know, um, to, to have various things that will help in, in long-term, um, the long-term perspective and so forth. And, you know, the, the I, ossification and the preservation are deeply tied yeah, right, right. institutions. The plus and the minus. Yeah. The plus and the minus. They're almost always yeah. together. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I just, as I read the Bible, as I see, you know, the early history of the church, I, I just, you know, I, 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 I don't see a lot of that, um, you know, the institutional part of it, you know, and, um, you know, I know, I know it's for a lot of people, it's very easy to say, Oh, the, you know, once the, the, uh, edict of milan happened and the and the, you know the, once you know catholicism started and all that kind of stuff that's the bad bad part or whatever and and uh, you know i i i, I realized there's history before that there is some institutional organizational history that preceded that it's not uh you know there's not some <clears throat> uh some magic that happened there that that, that messed everything up it's, hey, it's uh, there was a meeting that's reflected by acts 15 <laughs> they did have a meeting yeah yeah, so I, I do realize there's uh, it's, it's more complicated than um, than a lot of people would let on, but um, but yeah, I, I still um, you know I, I think uh, there's just you know and another thing I should mention about um, my reading is <laughs> um, uh, my wife and I homeschool our children. Uh, we have four kids, and we um, so I read a lot in that area too to yeah. prepare for that um, and. Um, we read John Holt and John Taylor Gatto and Yvonne Illich. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. There's <laughs> Illich is one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you can see where my, my, some of my influence comes from. Um, yes. Very, very non-institutional. Um, and so I, I've, I've very much appreciated uh, um, reading and listening to him. Um, basically everything he's done. <laughs> and um but also uh because i was into frost and hirsch i picked up on the line that they were in um they would reference leslie newbegin yep david bosch um yep. uh nt wright uh various people like that and so i started reading in that at vein too and so um Billick, another one that they mentioned and i i've I'm really interested to hear what Verveke was talking about with, with Tillich because yeah. his, his interpretation of Tillich, I think is a little different than my, you know, I've read Tillich extensively and that's kind of a, I, I don't know if, I don't know if I get Tillich the same way he's getting Tillich, you know? Um, I mean, right now I'm reading with us, with the small group we have on Sunday nights, we meet, for, uh, you know, it's been church for us and the, the, uh, in the small group we're going through, um, uh, Tillich sermons, a book of Tillich sermons. I've read, I've read his academic work, but um, going through his sermons, it's, it's hard to see how you would get to where, <laughs> where Reiki gets to with Tillich, you know, uh, being from the non-theist, you know, where he gets the non-theist perspective from him. But Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So there I, uh, are, there are volumes of, of some of, there are some collected sermons of Tillich that are out there in publication. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, and they're fantastic. And oh, um, I'm they're really, really good. Curious. They're really good for right now. Um, a lot of it, uh, like uh, shaking the shaking of the foundations, um, would be would be great to read right now. Um, you know, he's he's a little bit um, difficult. Uh, you know, re reading wise. Yeah. Um, he's uh, his academic work is very difficult. Um, yeah. And but but his sermons are obviously. Yeah. You know, well, with he, your he's sermon, you have to. Right, you know, right. You gotta, you gotta talk all, to somebody all, all outside the academy. <laughs> all types have to be in the audience there. So yeah, yeah. I understand that. But um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, shaking the foundations, and there's another one uh, that we're reading after that. Uh, the new, new being, I think maybe I, I can't remember the name of the book, so we haven't read it yet. But um, very good um, stuff. And now he does 
Hillock does get into um, uh, at at the end of the courage to be, I think, is the one where he talks about the um, God beyond the God of theism. And so, in in that in that relate, you know, in that space, I can see where he might be getting to a non-theist understanding. But um, but having read the whole book up to that, I I. I just take it differently than Vivek you take. Maybe perhaps, you know, it, perhaps there's something I'm not getting, but. <laughs> well, you know, we, you know, like I, I did a little dive into Nietzsche this week and re, how people read Nietzsche varies tremendously. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, we human beings are pretty mysterious creatures. And if you get someone as deep and complex as as Paul Tillich, yeah, you know, two people reading him aren't going to come away saying, "Oh, yeah, this is him." I mean, it's it's <laughs> right. gonna it's it's because you're it's you reading Tillich. It's not just you know the a monarchical vision of Paul Tillich, and so how John Verveke comes at this again with all of his story and I mean we again this is part of the uh, the reintegration of the subject. Um, and that's, I mean, that's where we're at. So. Right. Right. And I, um, I also, I should tell you how I came about, uh, Kush, Kush, your channel. My, um, my brother sent me, uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, the Bible series. Um, he sent me an email, I guess I was a of 17, somewhere in that range. Um, and he sent me a link uh, of Peterson doing the first, I think it was the first Bible series talk. And when I got done with that, I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> this is some interesting material to sift through. And, uh, and then shortly after that, I saw you. Um, and so, yeah, I've been watching a lot of your stuff for a while. <laughs> well, thank you. So, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate what you're doing with the estuary. And I, I really, I really, uh, I get that. I, I think that's awesome. And, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's kind of the type of, of missional projects that I've been trying to do. My wife and I've been trying to do in, in our context, um, for a while now. And, um, and I, I really, I really think that's a way to go. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I, Boy, oh, there's so much there <laughs> because, you know, especially when you come to institutions, there's so before, oh gosh, when I first came to Sacramento away from the mission field. So in the mission field, I mostly worked with small churches, you know, very small churches you needed mm-hmm. 10 baptized individuals to have a church. So the churches were very small and there are a lot of basically today you might call them chapels. They called them Campo Blancos, you know, white mm-hmm. fields. And there are a lot of preachers in those places. And so that's how the, this little church in the Dominican Republic sort of worked. And then I came back to North America and I accepted the call to this church and the whole classes was going out to Willow Creek for something for, to learn from the mega church movement. And, you know, that was not going to work at living stones. I mean, the, We've got way too much authenticity to be branded for a broad audience. That that became abundantly clear. And, and then we, and so instead of really going mega, I, I really turned to church more towards small group stuff. And then I read, um, you know, a bunch of the house church literature. And at that point in the, I mean, the, the seeker movement was dying. And one of the, one of the enduring areas that the seeker movement sort of, seeded a little bit was the cell church movement and the idea that what if what if the primary what if the primary instantiation of church were house churches instead of these you know because once you get up to scale then you're going to get the institutional dynamics and a bunch of the corruption and um let's say um very toss lubrication <laughs> <laughs> that that goes along with scale but in a in a in a group of people in meeting in a home of you know less than 10 or 15 people face to face life on life and that became a big thing at the beginning of the 
at the beginning of the 21st, um, the 21st century. And it kind of receded partly because it's very difficult to actually maintain that long term. And it's some of those value adds that institutions offer that sort of uh, allow individuals to shirk a bit of responsibility and formalize it in an institution. You, there's just nowhere to hide in that small setting, which makes it incredibly fruitful but also pretty significantly demanding. And if in your small group, you're reading Paul Tillich's sermons, you got a pretty, you got a, you got a pretty impressive little clump there. These aren't, these aren't people you randomly pick out of a church or off the street that can, you know, that can go with that. And I, I think about Nate Heil. I don't know if you've come across him, but Nate Heil's kind of in that same boat. No, where, I haven't heard of him. Yeah. He's got a, He's got a little YouTube channel, Grail Country, and I haven't done a conversation with him yet. I really have to. He's one of those people on my list. It's like, yeah, I got to talk to Nate. But he too is, he, he's he's in one of the, uh, have you talked to John Van Donk at all about getting in the estuary support network? No. Nope. You should talk to John Van Donk. Um, and Nate's in one of those groups. And so it's, you know, part of how I've sort of pitched estuary to churches is downstream and i've been reticent about pitching estuary as church for reasons i'm sure you can understand given the seats i sit in but i very much understand how you see it that way given the cell church home church model yeah it's um you know there's there's a lot of the institutional features that that um you know, just, just really rubbed me the wrong way when, when I was in, <laughs> when I was in it kind of on that side, on the other side of it, you know, behind the curtain, so to speak, you know, you're, you're reporting all the numbers up to the, to the denomination and the, and the money and the, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, you know, every once in a while, there'll be something coming down for you, you know, the, okay, we're doing this now we're doing, you know, we're doing this church growth movement thing or whatever, you know, not necessarily that, but I'm just saying one, you know, the types of things that might be coming your way, you know, whatever the various things, I mean, you're in it. So, you know, you know what you get, um, but you know, what you have to do both directions. And, and, and while, like I said, I, while I believe there are, you know, great people in, in the institutions, I just think that um, I just saw so many things were like, man, this is, this is unfortunate. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is really unfortunate. And I, I, I think it, um, you know, it, I think it really, I, I don't know. It's, it's, there's, like you said, there's pluses and minuses and, and uh, um, it's just hard for me, hard for me to, to go in that direction. <laughs> so, Well, I just went to a Rod Dreer um, event here in Sacramento and Rod can tend to get a little apocalyptic. And so if he's right, you're in good shape because um, <laughs> you know, if, if, uh, if, if the uh, if the big bad government is going to really crack down on churches, you're really under the radar, and anybody with a building and a sign is going to be right in their crosshairs. So, right, right. Well, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the uh, culture war stuff, I think, is um, uh, it depends on institutions because if there's not an institution to go into and and ca cause problems in, then you know if there's no seat of power to try to take over you know then then there's uh um i mean the, the 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 culture warriors really are are going after the 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 what they want is power it has nothing to do with in my opinion has nothing to do with whatever tools they're using whether that be the sjw stuff or whatever um those are just vehicles towards what they want and the, the power that they want is um I mean, you've you've been very open about what you're talking about in your own church with the um, gay marriage thing. I think is what it is. Yeah. That, and um, there's um, there's people who there's people in your denomination who I'm thinking, you know, I don't know these people. I'm just, I'm just guessing who who um, who might want to who might want to have this go over in a certain way because they view it as a, a power play. You know, they view it as, they, they view it as, okay, um, 
once once we can be shown to have have it made work here, you know, this will uh, be for our our cause or whatever. And I, I really think that that's um that's one of those things with institutions and you know whether it's the schools, you know, because you know a lot of my reading has been in the in that. Oh lane. yeah, Gatto. I mean, when my wife and I homeschooled and. You know, mm-hmm. she remember when she brought Gatto home and it's like, wow. <laughs> you said your wife's a teacher too. Yeah, she's a, she's <laughs> in the system. Well, that's well. So part of, you know, where we got here was she, we were homeschooling and, you know, for a while, the, um, you know, the state board of education was getting a little bit more tyrannical and threatening to crack down on homeschoolers. And so right. she said, well, I better get my teaching credential so if I have a teaching credential, that was sort of the avenue. If I'm a right. credentialed teacher, the state can't really get at me in terms of my children are not being educated. But in order to get a teaching credential, she entered into that system. Right. And then, you know, and then so for a while I was homeschooling while she was teaching in a in a regular school. Right. And right. so, you know, it's it's kind of crazy. Yeah. My, my mom was a teacher for many years and, and, and eventually went, went back to school and got into the administration end of it. And uh, she wrote a book not too long ago when she retired. And really, I mean, she was, you know, she's coming from the same perspective as, as, as I am. So to speak. And, and uh, in that, you know, she, she just saw how, how much wrong was done in the system in the name of educating, but it really was about, it was about something totally different. Yeah. And, and that, um, well, her book was, you know, it actually, she was out in your area. Um, uh, she retired, I guess, five or six years ago, and we moved her back this way. My brother and I loaded up all her stuff and drove across the country. <laughs> and um, but she, um, yeah, she was in uh, um, the, I guess, Rock, uh, Rockland, Roseville. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah somewhere, a suburb somewhere of, of Sacramento. I used to come through Sacramento once a year to yeah. to. I used to take kids one at a time to see her, you know, for little trips, little special trips with Grammy. And, yep. uh, and uh, yeah, so, um, so, sh- so it's been, a, a, it was a couple of years after that, that I discovered you or else I could have stopped by the church and said, hi, <laughs> on my way through. <laughs> but yeah, um, but, sh- but my mother has, uh, you know, a very interesting perspective, having worked as a teacher in, in three, in two different states and as an administrator in two, in two more different states. <laughs> so, uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and California um, for a good chunk of years in each one. So, well, the you know part of what my wife is seeing when the when COVID hit, my wife who was you know very popular with homeschool, you know really loved homeschooling, she saw the first year of COVID when they shut down the schools as this big opportunity to really help parents homeschool their children, and what the message she got back both from the institution, but also from the parents was, I don't want to spend all day with these kids. Right. Right. And that, that just breaks my wife's heart. So she's a, she's a Waldorf teacher, which means that she loops up with the kids. So she spends Mm -hmm. eight years with this group of 25 kids and they really become her kids. Some of these kids are spending more time with her than they are with their parents. And so, you know, the first class that she brought through when she had to sort of relinquish them to the world, it just broke her heart because they were her kids and she's she's an amazing teacher, an amazing mother. So yeah, that breaks, breaks my mom's heart, breaks my wife's heart. When she, when they, when they hear, hear parents, you know, not wanting to spend time with their kids. It's like, (laughs) well, it's it's very similar with churches. So one of our church plants was, was going to go the pure cell model. It's life on life. They had developed curriculum for, for faith formation. They did all of that. And so they went, you know, often with a church plant, you'll start with a core group very quickly. You'll get up to the worshiping community and then up from there, because you want to get up over 200 within the first two years. Otherwise you never really break the atmosphere as it were, but they decided, no, they were, they were going to be a cell group and just have maybe quarterly celebration services where they bring them all together, something like that. And basically what they learned was the people didn't want it. They wanted, you know, analogous to the schools, they wanted the big institution yeah. that was going to feed them. Right. And, yep. and they would, you know, they did all of this work with the people 
you know, explaining their vision, explaining their mission. This is life on life. What we're doing here in the living room is really the church. When we eventually do gather and do singing and celebration, that that will be sort of a, that'll be a celebratory other. But what we really do right here is, is right. church. And right. for the most part, people said, well, I don't want that. Right. I, want, I want an event I can come to and sit there and be fairly passive and enjoy it and feel like I've gotten a little formation in me and then go back to my life. And I'd really like to keep it within an hour. Thank you. So, yeah, right. no, I, I, no, no, you're absolutely right. And I think that's that's my theory is that it comes from school in, in our context, in the American context, our the the evangelical church or the Protestant most of the Protestant varieties of church. That's what it is. Well, well Catholic it, it, and Orthodox too. I mean, well, the Protestants a, inherited this. And right. in many ways, the Reformation was, you know, fueled by these little, these little, you know, conventicles, these little tiny little small groups, essentially. Right. They were the, they were the vanguard of the Reformation because they were the cells, the revolutionary cells. So, yeah. Well, what I'm saying is, is that they, they had a little different flavor. What I'm saying is, is that the, the flavor you see in, in the in most Protestant churches in America specifically is the, that consumeristic you know, flavor of church is, I think, a product of the schooling that we got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and no, the, I think you're right. We're, we're reflecting what we what we were raised in, you know, for, for four or five generations now of schooling where it's, you know, that that passive mode where you're where you're sitting back and you're part of the audience so we're you know we're an audience in front of the the movie screen the tv screen the basketball game the football game we're we're, we're an audience at church yeah and i i think that's part of the problem and and uh uh i mean you know you know that being a pastor <laughs> you're uh you know trying to get people to do stuff in the church you know to tr try to participate you know i i know is is killer for some pastors you know to have people want to be you know, to help you out, to be involved, to do, to do stuff, you know, whether it be in the church or in the community, it's, it's, uh, it's tough to get that, to switch, switch people out of that mindset, that psychological passive mindset into an active mode and into, into production mode. And some, not, I'm not saying, <laughs> not saying everyone, but some leadership, uh, you know, exacerbate that. Um, well, we don't, we don't want you, you know, <laughs> we don't want you doing any of this oh, yeah. up here, you know, oh, we don't absolutely. actually, I mean, we, you can, you know, do the stuff in the church with each other, you know, you, you know, be the Sunday school teacher, be the, whatever, you could do those different things. We don't want you actually doing anything that's, you know, no. the production. We're, we're the professionals, we're the professionals right. exactly. keep to the script. And it's, you know, if you know, you read Gato and, and others, you know, it's, it's fundamentally an industrialized model. And in, in right. that sense, do we, you know, not only shape the schools, but eventually came around to shape the churches too. That's what I think. Yeah. 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 I think, I think it's a, definitely a problem. And uh, so I, I think that, um, you know, that the estuary type thing you're doing and, and, you know, the get, getting, getting outside the church really is, is the, that's the missional end of it is, is really a, 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 because in the, in that consumeristic model uh, mode, um, you know, people are told to bring, people to the church you know, that's that's what what has gone for many years as the as as missions uh, go get some people bring them into the church and and that's really expecting people to come onto our territory into our turf and, and they're they're in an uncomfortable setting and they're in they're in an uncomfortable place and we really need to be we need to be the ones who are yeah and and even the issues of you know the the, the same-sex marriage issue that you know is destroying my denomination um in, in many ways, that's far better addressed in a small setting because then it's face to face, and you actually have once you once you level up into the industrialized region, now you've got issues of credentialing right. and standardization and basically behavioral management. I mean, in, in that sense, the entire all of this modern machinery enters into the church and many of the issues that we're dealing with are caused by that modernist industrial framework that the church has completely bought into to the degree that it doesn't really know how to live without. Right. 
yeah, that relational relational accountability that you have in a small group, like you said, dealing with that very sensitive, very personal issue um, face to face. I mean, that's the only way to do it is with re relational accountability. That if you're at the relational scale, um, you know, there's there's a lot of things that could go where you, where you can't do it at a, at a non relational scale. That that Dunbar number, you know, the one one forty eight or one fifty or whatever, having those th those ties that you have within the you know your your network is um, once you get outside of that, you, you're it's anonymizing. You know, and the bigger you get, the more anonymous it is, and and the more I think, not just corruption, which is a obviously a problem in any institution, but but um, not even on the corruption end, but just the, uh, you know, starting to be inhuman to one another, like like there is online. You know, people online are very they say things that they would never say to someone you know, in, in real life. Well, and I, I think that also gets into the, you know, the 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 crisis of the crisis of the person where we're at now is also partly caused by this because you know i experienced that very quickly when my channel got up above a thousand subs because when the channel was smaller which unfortunately was only for about a week uh because it just i mean youtube just got whoosh like, oh um and and what that meant was yeah, my Dunbar number was just exploded very quickly, which it hadn't been basically because of how small this church was. Mm -hmm. and, and and that sort of protected me for a long time in many ways. But suddenly, very quickly, the channel got beyond, you know, my capacity to, to remember everybody, to remember everybody's names, to remember everybody's story. I've got a pretty good memory. And so, you know, I can fake it fairly well in some cases, but there are, there are people out there who, who have been, you know, hurt and disappointed by me basically because in this modern frame, I can't, I can't value them as a person, as an individual, because I'm, I'm simply dealing with too many people. Sure. Sure. Yep. And, and it's, you know, I lament that, but I'm, I'm sort of trapped in it. And you can say, well, you can, you can destroy the trap by shutting down the channel and by, you know, turning off YouTube and, you know, changing my email address and getting off Twitter and going, getting back under the radar and saying no more of that. If you want to find me, you got to find me. And, right. uh, but, but that even then, you know, maybe after two, three years, people would forget about me, but is that the best thing to do now? Well, I don't know. Well, see, that's it's funny you mentioned that because because that's that's kind of you know kind of a, a pull in me. You know, localism, which is yeah. which is you know what my whole thing is is, um, you know, but the, but then I look at video of of you know Jordan Peterson talking about the, the biblical series, and that was valuable to me. Yeah, and and uh, and then I met you know met your channel and, and, and have, have learned many things. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's that, it's that thing. It's, it's that pull. It's like, I think only the in-person stuff is the real stuff. And that's the stuff we should focus on. But then also, you know, I read, I read Illich, you know, I, for example, other books, Gatto, Illich, yeah, yeah. You know. books themselves. And, yeah, right. Right. So yeah. The, that the once, once you have a book, that book breaks that Dunbar number. Right. If, right. if it's in any way successful at all. And yeah, so I think, it, yeah, so I think probably it's a balance and, and uh, it looks like you're, you're pulling it off. <laughs> well, so far, you know, I, I am, you know, and I, it's, you know, I'm at a war inside myself because on one hand, you know, people will say things like, well, if your channel grows, you can help more people. Oh, okay. I guess that's true. But if my, my channel is already of decent enough size that, and it's a small channel, you know, given, I mean, I started roughly about the same time as Jonathan Peugeot or Rebel Wisdom in roughly the same little corner of the internet. I mean, even John Vervecu's channel started later than mine. I mean, he's, his channel is, you know, two, three times the size of mine in terms of subscribers. And, you know, knowing something about metrics in the internet, subscribers are by no means the only metric. I mean, someone commented, this morning on a video, he said, you know, given the number of likes and the size of your channel, 
you have a you have a very you have a fairly determined audience yeah. and and that's true a fairly devoted audience and but still the audience is kind of big so and and you know Jesus struggled with this because on one hand you have his Galilean ministry which you know in the gospels in both the synoptic and in, in John's gospel, he gets to a point with the Galilean ministry that he basically decries it in some ways, turns on the mob and says to the mob, you know, you're, you're following me, but you're not following me. Right. And if you really were following me, uh, things would be different. And, and, you know, in the, in the gospel of Matthew, he basically says to the mob, on judgment day, it's going to be worse for you than for Sodom and Gomorrah or Nineveh. And it's like, oh, I'm amazed you didn't die right there because, and, and so then yeah. he goes down to Jerusalem and it's, you know, somewhere between 12 and 72, yeah. which again is within his Dunbar number. And in, in Jerusalem is where the, you know, the climax of the story gets reached. So these yeah. are, these, these are tricky, tricky things that we're dealing with in terms of size. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that looks that smaller but more intense discipleship you know that 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 model is is um you know this low evangelism the the uh, the key ecclesiology of the small you know that these are the types of things that 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 makes me think of you know the the just just the just the uh perspective you just shared you know it's it's um it's you know should we be focusing on discipling less you know less folks and and you know I don't know, you know, making more disciples, but, you know, less deeply, you know, yeah. what, what happens a lot in, in the mega churches and things like that, I think, um, you know, who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and at the same time, you know, I've read, read James Wellman's book, I really should talk to him. Um, he, you know, some of the points he made in defense of the mega churches, you can do some things. I mean, this is sort of where sort of the cell model arose and why, you know, my friends, you know, try to try to plant that because they, they wanted a hybrid system or is both. And yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and there's a lot to be said for that, but in the end, the consumers won <laughs> right? because the consumers were paying the, uh, in an industrial, you know, my, our friends came to a meeting myself and the past actually our past my fat pastor friend in the rockland area we were starting this cluster and and these two young idealistic church planters were like we don't really think of ourselves as an institution it's much more of a movement and my my, my friend says does your movement have a budget will your <laughs> movement pay you a salary <laughs> right. and, and you know it's that way in which we're all connected into this this giant, you know, it's this, it's the, it's giant beast in a sense that right. you don't really escape. Yep. Yeah. There's weeds and wheat in the church and there's weeds and wheat outside of the church. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, we only have, we only have about 10 more minutes yet. Is there any, I mean, is there anything you wanted to get to that we haven't gotten to? No, I think, I think we ended up at several different points. We ended up at the places I was hoping to get to all okay. along so that was uh it was a good discussion <laughs> well let me ask you this question where sure. would you like to see this channel go given all of its because you see it through and i mean you 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 see i i've i've got inside of me you know all of these conflicts yeah right <laughs> um you know in some ways i mean my channel couldn't be if my church had three four five hundred People. Yeah, yeah, you would not be on here. Yeah, I would not be here. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I simply could not. I would be right. Um, I would having to be, but now, especially after COVID, the church is tiny, right? And you know, can I visit people, especially when they're 80, 90 years old? And you know, yeah, so uh, no, you're you're uh, if you want to talk in Christianese, but in the in the YouTube world, it's you've made disciples. I mean, you you have a whole bunch of little YouTube channels that have spun off of, of yours. So in a way, you know, um, you have uh, it's it's kind of gross to talk about in that way. But but you know, it's it's like uh, uh, if if you were to look at the YouTube landscape in in the in the context of or way in which some people look at the church, you have you know uh, 
pod podcasts that have been started through your movement, so to speak, if you want to use that, you know, Christianese yeah. type type talk. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, more power to you. Well, and, and, you know, part of, you know, in a weird way, this is sort of YouTube on the other side of the Dunbar number, because one of the things that became apparent very early on was people who are following my YouTube channel slash podcast, because the audio, it's been interesting watching the numbers on the YouTube channel, and the numbers on the audio podcast, because the audio podcast keeps growing, but that's invisible to people coming to the youtube channel sure sure yeah. so now the the audio podcast which was just kind of an add-on is about a third of the size of the youtube channel a third to a half depending on the video of the of the reach that the, the the podcast doesn't scale up like youtube can because it doesn't fueled by this algorithm but you know people it, it became apparent to me fairly quickly that anybody who follows my channel gets more of me than most of the people in the church in a certain mm -hmm. way right because what you know what do i have to do on a sunday morning if they're only coming to the worship service they're getting 20 to 30 minutes you know i i, I put in 10 hours during the week um and it's coming every day and if they're going to the sunday school class well then they get another hour maybe but and the sunday school class is much more I mean, now I've been putting my Sunday school class on this channel too. And that's much more like my YouTube channel than a formal sermon, because a sermon, just like with Paul Tillich, you have to take all of this stuff and try and get it into a tiny little thing right. for a very general audience. And right. And you're in the broadcast mode rather than the di dialogical mode as we are. Yeah, you know? exactly. Right. So, so in some ways, YouTube sort of flips over the Dunbar number and, you know, a couple of thousand people, it's probably between two and 4,000 people listen to me three to three to seven days a week. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah, that's pretty intensive discipleship, mm -hmm. which is yeah. only facilitated by this medium. Right. And, and yet, like, like John Lejo talked with Peterson about, <laughs> the, the people out there are not it's not the same as, that's as right disciples in real life yeah. that's right that's right yeah. and and on you know on the original side of it jesus spending you know he had 12 apostles but you know a close reading and a reading of the tradition says you know there's probably this group of 50 to 100 that were really sort of on the inside mm -hmm. um you know they lived with him they I mean, they had him more hours in a day than even my rather oppressive volume that I put out can <laughs> afford and yeah. a much richer because, you know, again, and uh, people will say, well, you're my pastors. I can't be your pastor this way. Not really. Right. right. Because right. you're not, you're only seeing me through this dark mirror. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, the people in my church, part of the reason they don't watch my YouTube channel is. In some ways, they know me better, but it's a different me that they know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy making. Yeah, yeah. So, well, God yeah. bless you and your and your work. Well, thank you. This is wonderful. <laughs> uh, is this something that you'd be? Do you want to watch it before I share it, or what would you like me to do with this? Yeah, if you don't mind, um, I okay. just want to make sure I hadn't mentioned something and and forgot that I shouldn't have mentioned that or something. No, you know? <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, sometimes what people have done actually, and because you're a computer guy, sometimes what people have done actually is edited the video and sent it back to me because there was a couple things that they said that oh, I really shouldn't have said that. And that's, that's totally okay. And it's also oh, totally cool. okay to not cool. share it. But yeah. I, you know, I liked, I liked a bunch of the stuff that we talked about today. And um, I think it, you know, I, I wrestle too, because I, I, you know, obviously on this side of YouTube, I see the analytics mm -hmm. and the, you know, the conversations with randos never get the views that right. the conversation with Peugeot or Verveke or, right. or some of the, some of the monologue or commentary videos with a hot title will get, but sure. these sure. are in many ways, I think in some ways, the real channel and the real 
where that where the real work is being done in the channel sure sure yep anyway yep so thank you jason this has been a pleasure so i thank will you. i will send this to you and you can decide if this is something that you'd like to keep for yourself or if you'd be okay sharing it etc cetera, etc cetera. Cool. thanks paul great it's great to talk and hopefully if i ever get the estuary tour back up and going if uh covid sort of stops disrupting plans um maybe i'll maybe i'll get out to the i've got some friends in the dc area so um, oh cool yeah definitely I'd like to get out there so yeah it'd be cool to catch up yeah thank you jason thank you paul I'll talk to you later okay bye-bye